chapter 30. <clears throat> Proverbs chapter 30. I thought about this passage this weekend. I've preached from it before, but I really got thinking about it after Wednesday, Wednesday night's lesson when we were talking about weakness. We talked about the Apostle Paul and the thorn that he had in the flesh and how that weakness, he thought that that would be a, uh, he thought that it was a hindrance to him. And in very many ways, I'm sure it was. Uh, I'm sure that it made him feel ill at times. I'm sure that it made him weak. I'm sure that it um, is something that he really wanted to get rid of, right? And we talked about that Wednesday night. And I got thinking about weakness and how the Lord uses us in spite of our weaknesses uh, and how often uh, weaknesses are given intentionally. Paul's weakness was given to him, he felt, because of the abundance of visions, of the abundance of revelations that he had. And he felt that that was the way the Lord knew to keep him humble, to keep him prayerful, to keep him uh, leaning on Christ. And in Proverbs chapter 30, um, again, there are four creatures that are mentioned here that are little, that are weak, uh, but the Bible says that they are wise. And so we're going to talk about these creatures again today. We're going to learn about weakness and how these creatures, despite their weakness, are very useful. They have found great success uh, despite their weakness. Okay, Proverbs chapter 30, verse 24, There be four things which are little upon the earth, but they are exceeding wise. The ants are a people not strong, yet they prepare their meat in the summer. The conies are but a feeble folk, yet they make their houses in the rocks. The locusts have no king, yet go they forth all of them by bands. The spider taketh hold with her hands and is in king's palaces. Uh, while each of these um, creatures have weaknesses that could be focused on, the Bible says that they are wise. First of all, again, number one, let's talk about our weakness. We talk about strengths and weaknesses, and certainly we would rather talk about our strengths. Uh, but every now and then we confess our weaknesses because we realize um, that we have them. That's God's way of reminding us that we need him. It's God's way of reminding us, lest we get too, um, too big for ourselves, too, too big ahead, get too reliant upon our own strength. Um, we often deal or encounter some type of weakness. Uh, Paul was a very spiritual man and had that weakness, right? He had a thorn in the flesh, as we spoke about Wednesday night. That weakness was not an indication that he was weak spiritually or that he lacked spirituality. Uh, he was a very strong spiritual man. Um, now, sometimes weaknesses are a lack of spirituality. Uh, and, you know, if you say that your weakness is, well, I just can't ever overcome temptation, well, that would be spiritual then, wouldn't it? Um, but not all weaknesses imply a lack of spirituality. Certainly, weakness doesn't mean or imply that the Lord can't or won't use us. Though Paul had a thorn in the flesh, I think we'd be hard-pressed to find anyone that was used more. Right? Paul wrote uh, better than half of the New Testament, was a great missionary. I mean, Brother John, when we started the mission work, he went through the book of Acts when you get to the last half of the book of Acts, when Paul and Barnabas go out on the missionary journey, and the last half of that book deals greatly with his missionary endeavors. Um, so, so it's, you know, you'd be hard-pressed to find somebody that was more active and more used historically than the Apostle Paul was. And this was, of course, despite his weakness. You know, some people think, well, if I have a weakness, I can't really be used or I won't be any good until I get rid of it. Well, that obviously wasn't true for Paul. It was in his weakness that he found the Lord strong. And why Paul could say, when I am weak, then I am strong. In learning to lean on Christ, that was when Paul found himself most useful. Okay? Don't plan on getting all things figured out. Don't plan on becoming the best version of you and then getting involved in the Lord's service, okay? Um, get involved in the Lord's ser service, warts and all, weaknesses and all, okay? And then lean on him and trust him. 
Okay? We will one day be a perfect version of ourselves, right? One day we'll be glorified. One day sin will be in the past. One day we won't have any weaknesses. Now that's heaven, right? That's way in the future. That's not going to happen any time in your life down here. So if you're waiting to be perfect, if you're waiting to get rid of all of your weaknesses and your struggles before you attempt to be useful or get involved in the Lord's service, uh, it just won't work that way. Okay? So, so get involved in his service um, now. Try to, try to serve the Lord, work for him as much as you can, because weakness is certainly not the end of the story. Of course, we've got weaknesses. I dare say that you do, uh, but don't, growl, don't grovel over it. Don't throw in the towel. Don't think that you can't be used or do anything. Uh, learn to serve the Lord with what you can do and where you are. All right, we, we say all that by way of introduction. Now let's look at these four creatures, okay? When you come to Proverbs chapter 30, the weaknesses that these little creatures have uh, all have to do with their nature. This is who they are. There is no amount of work or no amount of time, no amount of effort is going to change the nature of these creatures, okay? They are what they are. These weaknesses are not going away. And yet, they have learned how to get things done anyway. Okay? They have learned what to do and how to work and get things done anyway despite their weaknesses. So let's talk about these this afternoon. First of all, let's talk about the ant. Everybody knows what an ant is, right? Proverbs chapter 30, verse 25, the ants... And these are talking about the bugs. This is not talking about your Aunt, you know, Selena or Aunt Ty or Aunt Mandy. Okay, that's corny. The ants are a people not strong, yet they prepare their meat in summer. You guys ever heard the story, I'm sure you have, of the ant and the grasshopper or some kind of comparison story like that? Um, you know, long before that story was there where you learn about the ant who was working and working diligently and working hard while the grasshopper was taking the summer off and being lazy, long before that story was ever put down on paper like that, uh, the Bible had already basically told us that and given that as an encouragement to us um, as a matter of wisdom. Verse 25 says, the ants are a people not strong. How, how big is an ant? I mean, even the little ones that are here, is there any of you that just couldn't crush a little ant between your fingers? Now, maybe you wouldn't want to, right? Because it's kind of gross, It'd be kind of gicky. But that, that they're so, so small. You would think, how in the world... Could an ant ever accomplish anything? You know, how, how, do, how do ants even survive? You know, because they're so small and this world is so big and the elements, I mean, uh, how in the world do they get anything done? Well, notice what it says. The ants are a people not strong, yet they prepare their meat in summer. Ants are weak. And they are a lesson to us in preparation and opportunity. You see, because ants are weak, they realize they have to work longer. Ants have to put in more work, right? Ants, if they are going to, as the story goes, if an ant is going to have food for the winter, what does an ant have to do? It has to work, right? And how long does it have to work? It has to work all summer long, storing up food, getting it ready, getting ready so that they can survive the winter. Isn't that what it says here in verse 25? The ants are people not strong, yet they prepare their meat in the summer. An ant is not going to be able to go out in the middle of winter and find something to eat. An ant has to do all of its work in preparation. They have to do all of their work ahead of time. You know what that means? That means that while the weather is nice and it's a beautiful summer day, the ant has to take advantage of that opportunity. They have to work hard. They have to work hard that day, getting ready for winter, getting ready to store up food. You know, sometimes, um, 
you know, you can see that. You can see you've experienced that with maybe, um, like maybe even kids, right, with schoolwork. Um, isn't it true that sometimes there may be, you know, maybe some kids, they just have to, they have to work longer. You know, maybe they have to work a little harder. They have to work a little bit longer to get it. And it doesn't mean that they can't get it. It doesn't mean that they're not smart. It doesn't mean that they're not able. They're just built in the way that they, you know what, they have to study a little harder. They have to work a little bit harder for it. So you know what happens? They have to, before the test, or before the exam, or whatever's coming, they have to take advantage of all the time that they can to work and to study and to prepare. The ant is a lesson in that in preparation and taking care of this opportunity. I'm really bad about procrastinating. You guys know what it means to procrastinate? Procrastination is when you assume or think, well, I'll have time to do that later, so I'm going to do something else right now, right? Elliot, I need you to, I need you to clean your room today. Well, she said today, so... I can play video games right now, and I'll just clean my room later. Well, he plays his games, doesn't clean his room, and then it gets to the evening, and Mom says, well, I'm going to go up to Granny Ree's. Guess what happens now? You didn't clean your room, did you? You thought, you thought, well, the time would come and I'll do it later. And then the day filled up and you wasted the opportunity you had. And then it gets to evening and it's supper time. And then mom wants to go to Granny Ree's. And then it's time to come home and get a bath and get ready for bed. And mom opens the door and what? Your room's a mess. That's procrastinating. You had time. You had an opportunity to do something and you didn't do it. I'm as guilty as anybody of that. I, I like my lazy time as much as much as everybody else does. But an ant is a lesson in wisdom because they take advantage of the opportunity when it's available. They are not going to wait until winter. They're not going to wait until fall. While the weather is nice, while the opportunity is there, they will take advantage of it. Proverbs chapter 6, verse number 6. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 6. Go to the ant, thou sluggard, you lazy bum. Consider her ways and be wise. Just watch. You know, the writer of Proverbs, isn't it weird that he says, you want to be wise, just, just go watch an ant. If you're lazy, if you're a sluggard, if you're one of those lazy bums, just take a few minutes, go to the ant, consider her ways and wise up. Because what you will see is work. And you know what? They can't do nearly as much as you. Do you think an ant could lift that big old piece of ham that Elliot was eating on earlier today? No. Do you know what it's going to have to do? It's going to have to take it little piece by little piece by little piece. And it may take it weeks, and it may take it months to carry what you could carry in 30 seconds but it's wisdom that, sh- that tells that ant, winter's coming, keep busy, take advantage of every opportunity. In Proverbs 10, verse number 5, the Bible says, He that gathereth in summer is a wise son, but he that sleepeth in harvest is a son that causeth shame. So what does the ant teach us? Well, weakness should not be a hindrance from us taking advantage of every opportunity that we can. If you have the opportunity to do something, to be involved in some kind of service, to be faithful in some kind of action, do it. Take advantage of every opportunity. You never know if you'll get it again. I'm guilty of that. I like to procrastinate, and I usually assume that, well, if I don't do it now, there'll always be an opportunity to do it later. Um, But that is an assumption, right? There is no guarantee. We don't know how much time. We don't know who, you know, We don't know what the future holds. You know, there may be somebody that I need to witness to. 
And I may think, you know, no matter how many times, you know, people at work or people that I meet uh, in public, you know, oh, well, I'll see them again. I'll, I'll, I'll have an opportunity. Um, I, I don't know that, though, right? So wouldn't wisdom teach me take advantage of the opportunities when you have them because to assume that it'll be there in the future really is to presume. And uh, wisdom teaches you, no, right now, this opportunity, okay? So let's learn that from the ant. A little weak thing that you could squish between your fingers, but you can learn a lot from its wisdom, how hard it works, okay? Proverbs chapter 30, verse 25, the ants are a people not strong, yet they prepare their meat in the summer. Verse 26, we'll talk about the conies. Because the conies, it says, are a feeble folk, yet make they their houses in the rocks. So if the ants are a lesson on preparation and opportunity, conies are a lesson in defense. Now, I don't know what a cony is. From different things that I've read, everybody says something different about them. Um, some kind of rabbit-like creature, maybe a hyrax, a rock badger, um, different things. I've read a whole bunch of different things. But no matter what animal it turns out to be, the, the understanding is basically the same across the board. Conies are very small. They are weak. Um, on their own, they do not put up a great defense. They are not going to intimidate someone. If there are predators out in the wild, and there are, uh, conies are not a predator. They would be the prey, right? They would be not the hunters, they would be the hunted. So the cony knows that in its weakness, uh, and because it's liable to become prey for, for someone who is bigger, for a larger enemy or a predator, what does it say? It says in verse 26, there are but a feeble folk yet, they make their houses in the rocks. They know where to hide. Conies know where to hide. And they don't stray very far from the rocks. Because what happens if a cony gets away too far from the rocks? Well, by the time they see the predator, it may be too late. Because there are going to be enemies that are bigger, that are faster. And if they get too far away from the rocks, they're going to be too far away from safety. This is where they know it's safe. And so it says there in verse 26, they make their houses in the rocks. And they learn to rely on those rocks for their defense, not their own. They're not able to defend themselves. They're not large animals. So they rely on those rocks to protect them and to keep them safe. And they don't get far from them. In the book of Psalms, Psalm 61, conies are a good example for us. It would be wise for us to listen and take note of that. Because they're a lesson to us in refuge. And in defense, conies can't afford not to take refuge, right? They don't hide out in the open. They certainly don't hide up in the trees. Um, they have found the rocks to be a trustworthy place of defense. And so they don't get very far away. Doesn't that sound pretty wise? Doesn't that sound like wise advice? If we're, you know, we are as Christians, the Bible tells us that we have an enemy. And actually the Bible says that our enemy is like a roaring lion. And he walks around seeking whom he may devour. And I tell you what, that lion would like to snatch up a coney if he could. That'd make a nice little meal, wouldn't it? Our adversary, the devil, is hoping to catch us. You know, the devil loves nothing more than when God's people uh, are vulnerable and they get away from their, their, their defense. They get away from the Lord. They get out there and they get into trouble and they get into temptation and he loves to snatch them up. He loves to devour. He seeks whom he may devour, the Bible says. Psalm 61, verse number one, the Bible says, Hear my cry, O God, attend unto my prayer. From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For thou hast been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. You know what would be wise for Christians, for us, is to realize our weakness. That we are not all powerful. 
right? There, there are things out there that, that are dangerous to us as believers. We would be vulnerable. We would be unwise to think that we can overcome everything out there on our own. Christians would be wise to never stray too far from their defense. Now, the Lord is our defense, right? We would be wise, like those conies who never get too far away from the rocks, to never get too far away from the Lord. Keeping in mind that there's an adversary who's walking around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, hoping and watching, right? Remember when the Lord talked to Satan about Job and he said, well, have you considered my servant Job? And do you remember what Satan's answer was? Satan's like, yeah, I know all about Job and I know how you've put protection around him where I couldn't get to him. How about that? Satan had already been watching Job before God even suggested, you know, Satan had been looking, Satan had been watching and he knew. Don't ever stray too far, okay? We should make it a point and wisdom would make it a point in our lives to tell us, let's make sure we stay close to the Lord. Let's live in his strength. Let's live in his defense. Uh, let's seek him. Let him be our refuge. Let him be our safety and continue to look to him. Listen, we all succumb to temptation at times. There are all always times that we're not uh, as faithful as we ought to be. And there are times where we struggle, right? Um, but a good lesson for, uh, for us is the Coney that knows, you know what, there's safety right here. And wisdom says, don't get too far out. Don't get too far away. And that's the same way that it is with us, okay? Let's not stray too far from the Lord. Um, it's dangerous, and we certainly don't want to be. All right, Proverbs chapter 30. These little creatures are wise, aren't they? You see, you look at them and you think that they're weak. But the writer of Proverbs says that these are exceeding wise. An ant is really, really small. But they take advantage of every opportunity. A coney is weak. They're feeble. So they don't stray very far from the rocks. And locusts have no king. Verse 27. Yet go they forth all of them by bands. Do you know what a locust is? We don't see them a ton around this part. Um, locusts are pests, right? And the Bible uses them as a plague, and they devour. Now, a locust is small enough that you could squish it under your foot. Did you know that? You could squish a locust right under your foot. You could put it under your heel, squish it, and it's gone. But you know the problem with locusts is we always use that term in the plural. You ever seen a locust by itself? You know why? Because locusts don't go by themselves. Now, they don't have a king. That's not the hierarchy that they have. That's not the order. That's not how their species works. But it says the locusts have no king, yet go they forth all of them by bands. You know, despite how weak a single locust is, you know, when the Bible talks about a plague, you remember one of the 12 plagues in, in the land of Egypt? 10 plagues, excuse me. One of the 10 plagues, uh, locusts. And you know what they did? They devoured. Because one locust can't do a bunch. But when they all come together, and millions of them, and millions of them, and millions of them come, History is full of the story of plagues and the devastation that those little creatures, those little bugs can do. And they're small and they're weak and you could squish it under your heel. But when they come, they come in bands. They come in numbers. And when they come in numbers, they make a devastating force. In the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 4, Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 
verse 7, then I returned and I saw vanity under the sun. There, there's one alone. There's not a second. Yea, he hath neither child nor brother. Yet is there no end of all his labor? Neither is his eye satisfied with riches. Neither saith he, for whom do I bereave, or labor and bereave my soul of good? This is also vanity. Yea, it is of sore travail. Because for all of his wealth and for all of his work, what does it say? There is one alone and there's not a second. You know, some of the most, you know, one of the most miserable existences is that of somebody who's just alone. And it doesn't matter how much money they have. It doesn't ha matter how much they've acquired. Uh, money can't buy the stuff that they're lacking. And he's, he's alone. Loneliness is terrible. Loneliness is a terrible feeling. And it says in verse 9, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him that is alone when he falleth, for he hath not another to help him up. Again, if two lie together, then they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? And if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Locusts are a lesson in teamwork and working together. And this passage tells us the advantage that we have when we are together. You know, the Bible says it's a good thing that the brethren dwell together in unity. I think it's Psalm 133. How blessed it is that the brethren dwell together in unity. And, and locusts are a lesson in that. In, as despite their weakness and how small they are, you don't see them alone. And they work together and together they make a great and large force. Two are better than one. You know, if one falls, it'd be nice to have somebody help you up, right? Or if you were out on a cold and a lonely night, it'd be nice to have somebody to kind of huddle up with, right? And, and, and keep warm with. If I was in trouble, I'd sure like somebody to stand there. You know, I've got two sons here and their brothers. And, you know, it'd be nice to think that if they're out there and they're out in the world and they're out together, it's probably less likely that somebody will come up and pick on Elliot when Elliot's got a brother that's standing right there, right? And now what it says, if one prevail against him, two shall withstand him. It's going to be really hard to pick, pick on this guy, to pick on this guy and, and to try to pick a fight with him or push him around because you know what? Hey, big brother's right there. Big brother's going to defend. Big brother's going to help. Now, if you're lonely and weak, that, that, that's a terrible state. We as Christians should, should take advantage of the opportunity that we have in our families and our fellowship here together as a church to stay united, to stay on the same page. There is nothing more that Satan would like than to get into our family and our churches and to split us up and to keep us apart and to make us fight with each other and to get us mad and angry at each other. And listen, those things are going to happen. There are things that we're people, right? We all have different personalities. I like certain things and you like certain things. And, and, um, and we don't see eye to eye on all of the things that we enjoy or the things that we want to do or, or even in our outlook in life sometimes. But the devil would like nothing more than to take those differences and to, to get us bickering at each other and fighting with each other because he knows individually we are more vulnerable than we are together. Unity is something that we need. These locusts are a lesson in that, okay? A lesson in unity. So learn that. Let us learn as believers our need of each other, that two are better than one, that we have a greater reward for our labor when we work together and how we do need each other. Okay. Proverbs chapter 30, Proverbs chapter 30, the locusts have no king, yet they go forth all of them by bands. 
And lastly, verse 28, the spider taketh hold with her hands and is in the king's palaces. Again, spiders aren't much, are they? They're pretty small. Um, you ever seen a spider web? You ever seen a spider web? You ever wonder how a little bitty spider can make something like that? You ever wonder how quickly those things pop up? You know, you could go there one day, and then by the next week when you come back, there's this big old spider web. And you ever notice how spiders are everywhere? It doesn't matter where. Spiders are in your house. They're in the garage. They're out in the yard. They're in the bathroom. There's some around here, I'm sure. Spiders are everywhere. It says, that, it says, the spider taketh hold with her hands and is in king's palaces. Do you know what a spider does? A spider just keeps working. It keeps spinning its web. It keeps working. It keeps weaving. It keeps on working. And because it is so, let's look what it says in Proverbs 22 and verse 29. Proverbs 22, verse 29. Seest thou a man diligent in his business? He shall stand before kings. He shall not stand before mean men. Now, what does that mean? A man diligent in his business, he shall stand before kings. It's, it's basically, it's a simple way to say this. Keep an eye on somebody who is a diligent and a hard worker. He's just faithful to work and to work, and he's diligent about his business because that guy is probably going places. That guy is going to end up somewhere that most other people aren't. Somebody who's just a hard worker, who's dedicated, and will just work. And he's not working for glory, and he's not working for, uh, you know, for, for all of the other motives or reasons. But, he, you know, you ever just meet people that just have that good work ethic that, uh, it just speaks really, really well of them. The proverb says, keep an eye on somebody like that because that guy's going places. Those are the people that you see standing before kings. Those are the people that you see making a difference. Those people that are dedicated, they're faithful, they're diligent, they're hardworking. It's like a spider, right? You see a spider and you see the same thing that I do. You see a nuisance. You see something small that you want to grab a newspaper, roll it up, and just swat it. And yet what happens? That spider just goes to, if you don't get it, that spider just goes to another corner of the house. And it starts working its web there. And you might chase it, and you might get the broom out in a couple of weeks and knock down that web. You know what you're going to find? A couple of weeks, that spider's got another web put up somewhere else. Hard work. Just keep working. Right? The spider taketh hold with her hands and is in king's palaces. All of these things that we've looked at today are what? They're weak. They're small. They're, they, you wouldn't think that they would have a great impact uh, at all. The Bible says you can learn a lot from these things. Because the ants will teach you about opportunity. And taking advantage of opportunity. And preparation and procrastination. And the conies will teach you about defense and not getting too far away from the rocks. And locusts will teach you about sticking together and about unity. And spiders will teach you about diligence and working hard and just keep going. At the end of the day, you know what you've learned? You've learned a lot from something or someone who's incredibly, incredibly weak. We are weak. On our own, we don't have much strength. On our own, we have no strength. Our help is in the Lord. We rely on him for our strength, for our courage, for our help, whether it is in, in service, in faithful witness, or whatever it may be. We're relying on him to provide the courage, the ability, the strength to perform when it's time. Because we are weak. And yet, these four things are also weak, and yet they have figured out how to get the job done. The locusts have found that their source of strength 
is staying together. The ants have found that their source of strength is found in harder work, is found in preparation and opportunity. The conies have found that their source of strength is the rocks. Listen, we are weak. And yet, if we too would find our source of strength and rely on it, I think we would be able to perform great work and do more than we ever thought imaginable, just like we can learn from these creatures. All right? So like we were talking about Wednesday and we talked about weakness, it's not the end. That is not the end of the story. Even in our weakness, we can do much. We can do great things for the Lord because he is an ever plentiful supply of strength. When we're relying and when we're trusting in the Lord, we have, there is a strength there that you can be sure isn't going to run out. It's not going to run dry. Okay? You're going to work, and if you work as hard as you could today, you would go to bed tonight whipped, right? You'd go to bed so tired. Did you know the Lord's not getting tired? And when you go to bed tonight, the Lord is still an ever-present and ever-plentiful source of strength. Learn where our strength is. And then, even in our weakness, we'll be able to do great things. All right? All right. Well, and that's our lesson. Tell you what, why don't we all stand together? We'll close with a song.